What's up, everybody? Uh, how you guys doing? Happy Sunday. First of all, apologies to everybody. I know I'm running super late. I was supposed to start 17 minutes ago. I'm so sorry. Um, let me just quickly tell you what happened before we jump into the live stream. This morning, I went down to get uh, coffee at my favorite coffee place. And I grabbed the wrong set of keys, and then I got my door, it, it automatically locks, and it's an elect electronic lock. I have to use a special key fob to get in. And that was it, and it's Sunday. There's no maintenance people here, anything. So once that happened, I was locked out of my place. I couldn't get back in. There's nothing I could do. I had to, thankfully, I was able to get a, an Uber, go straight to my friend's place, which was about 15 minutes away, grab the spare key, come back. Uh, and so I'm all out of sorts. You know, I'm like, I was like running, uh, rushing to get here. Uh, so I, I really didn't want to be late. I try to never, ever be late for these live streams. So first of all, so sorry. Thank you guys who are still on here and waiting. And I'm going to try and give you in a really powerful study session today for the math SAT. So again, thank you so much for sticking around and waiting, all of you guys. Okay, so today we are tackling the March, uh, again, we're tackling the calculator section of the March SAT. Yesterday, if you tuned in, we did the no calculator section. If you didn't check that out or if you missed it, it's uploaded now and, and you can watch. And for those of you guys who are new today, what I'm doing is I'm taking the entire SAT as if I was taking it for real. So I'm, I'm timing myself but I'm just explaining the problems as I go along because I can usually do it as I'm processing and problem solving. The reason why I'm doing that is because I'm trying to, I want to show you guys in real time what's what's possible and what you're capable of doing, how to think on your feet. And I, I haven't seen this test. Uh, this is essentially my first time. Now there's a handful of problems on this test that I have reviewed with one of my students. So there may be a couple here and there that I have seen because we've gone over the ones that she that uh, she's gotten incorrect. But overall, it's meant to be a fresh experience. So you can see me reacting in real time. All right. Okay. Um, yes. And Mahmoud, you said before starting, what's up? Hey, what's up, Iman? Okay, oh shoot, hold on here. I'm just getting this queued up to problem one. Here we go. Make sure it's zoomed in nicely so you guys can see properly. Okay, now let's get the timer set up. And this test is, oh, what? how long is it again? <laughs> I think it's 55 minutes, right? Let me just double check. Yeah, 55 minutes. Sorry, blank for a second. I'm really just all out of it today. Two, zero, five, five. Oh. Okay, five, five, zero, zero. There we go. And uh, what'd you say? Your photo to try. Oh, hey, Mahmoud, how is it now? Because I, I zoomed in. How does this look? Uh, by the way, Yusuf, if you want to get this test, uh, I mentioned before, just Google uh, Reddit QAS. And you'll be able to find all of these this test and other ones too. Okay, if you wanna if you wanna see this. All right, guys. Other thing, I got my calculator queued up here. Let's clear that. I got my calculator ready to go, so I'll be flipping back and forth if and when I need it. Are you guys ready? And now, while I'm taking the test, I've, I'm gonna have the timer up, so I'm not gonna be looking at the chat. So just follow along until I finish the test, and then once I'm done, I'm gonna come back and look at. I'm gonna come back and uh, I'm gonna come back and look at all your comments. And then if you have questions on particular problems, I'm gonna go through those and try and clear everything up. Okay, guys, ready, set, and begin. Okay, Mika Michaela is playing an event, 5,400 square foot room. There should be at least eight square feet per person. What is the maximum number of people? Okay, this is just a straight division problem. I'm gonna use the calculator, 5,400 divided by eight, and it's 675. Because we want, whenever we have something per something, it's always the number per the other one divided by the, the number after the word per. And so you see it's square feet per people. Next, note, figure not drawn to scale. There are three lines that intersect if x equals 65, right? We're gonna fill in the diagrams. That equals 65, y equals 75. What is the value of z? So here we go, 65, 
Um, Z is this angle in here. Now, 65 plus 75 plus whatever this is have to equal 180. 65 plus 75, 130, 140. This angle must be 40 degrees because they're on a straight line, right? So they all have to add up to 180. And this is also a vertical angle with Z. Therefore, Z vertical angles are equal. Z must be 40. If this was the value of x variable isolation, let's get common denominators. I'm going to make that 3 over 6x. Multiply top and bottom by 3. Minus 1, 6x equals 1. That becomes 2, 6. Oops, 2, 6 x equals 1 and then I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal this is actually just one third I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal which is 3 over 1 3 over 1 and x equals 3 okay this one I you can plug back in to make sure it's 3 halves minus 1 half which is of course 1 uh, the scatter plot above shows eight data points in the plane uh, if each data point is shifted three units upward a new line of best fit is drawn. How will the value of the y-intercept of the new line cover? It's just going to go up three. It's going to go up to four. It will increase, of course. Wait, hold on. Let me just make sure I read that right. Data point is shifted three units up. New line of best fit. How will the value of the y-intercept of the new line? Yeah, of course. The whole line is going to shift up like this. That's it. Okay. Next. Lines L and K in the xy plane are graphs. The equation says, how many solutions does it have? One. Right there. A solution is just another. Oops, it's just another way of saying how, where do they intersect? How many points? It's either zero for lines. It's either zero, one, or infinite. Gerardo has three blue shirts and W white shirts in his closet, and they're the only shirts in the closet. Gerardo selects a shirt at random. Which of the following gives the probability that he'll select a white shirt? Okay, so probability is the number of ways to win, which is however many white shirts he has. That's the number that he's trying to get over the total, which is three blue shirts plus W white shirts. And that's probability, and it's A. The vertical height in meters of the this thing is blah, 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 blah. OK. And the graph 0, 0 represents the entry to the bridge. Which of the following points represents the exit to the bridge? So the exit would be here, I assume. I, I'm, I'm, hold on. OK, so all they want is. Wait a minute. Height of arc. I'm, I'm assuming that's the zero point. Wait. Vertical height in meters of the upper arch. Come up with a function. Yeah. From the entry of the bridge. Wait. Uh, represents the entry of the bridge. Which the following represents the exit on the opposite end. I'm assuming it's this point, which is this. I'm just not sure if it's that or the vertex. Because I'm confused. Oh, the vertex isn't an option. Because it would be 2150. OK, it's got to be this, I guess. Um, I'm not sure. It, it's unclear to me that this has to be the exit. But I'm assuming if this is the entrance, this is the exit, and this is the middle point. I don't know. A little confused, but I think that's it. Next, the graph is a line in the xy plane that passes through the point blank and has SOPA 5. So which of the following it could define the function f? OK, SOPA 5, so it's y equals 5x plus b, and then I'm going to plug this in. So x is 0, b is 2, 2 equals b. Oh, wait, yeah. Oh, yeah, obviously, that's the y-intercept. So it's y equals 5x plus 2. There's my equation. 5x plus 2, boom. Could define the function. Yep, just making sure I didn't misread that. Citrus production. The scatter plot shows the citrus production millions of tons. Which following could be the slope of the line of best fit. So a line of best fit would look something like this, I'm guessing, right through the middle. And what I just drew looks like it would have a slope of, let's see, I'm just approximating. We're at 17.5 here, so we're going up by 7.5, up by 7.5, over by 1, 2, 3. So I'm guessing it's about 7.5 divided by 3, which is 2.5, right? So it should be about 2.5. Should be about that's the closest one. Uh, maybe I could have drawn a little lower, but yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah, I'm going with it. It's our best bet. I did that right, right? Up. Let's say it's up six over three. Yeah, sure. Two. Why not? The function f is defined above. Which of the following is not an x-intercept of the graph? 
Okay, so x-intercepts are whatever make this go to zero. So the x-intercepts are negative four. That makes that go to zero. One, x, one minus one is zero. And then three halves, because three halves times two is three, minus three is zero. So these are the x-intercepts. Which of the following is not an x-intercept? So that is, that is not, that is, that is. Okay, questions 11 through 12 refer to this. Length of CT in inches of a catfish first year after life can be approximately a linear function. Boom. Some of the values are given in the table above. Here is the length, f of t, in inches of a flathead after the first year of life can be approximated by this. Okay. So it doesn't give the linear function. I don't know if we need it. According to the model, which of the following is the closest expected age to the nearest whole year of a flathead catfish that is 31 inches long? Okay, so if it's 31 inches, hold on. Oh, so this is a flathead. No, flathead catfish. Wait, hold on. That's a channel catfish, it's a flathead. Okay, so it's 31 inches. So f of t is in. So 31 equals the second equation. Just had to figure out which equation to use. And then we isolate t. 3t equals 27. Divide, oops, divide both sides by 3t equals 9. So it's after the first year of life. So nine years after the first year of life is 10 years old. Okay, which of the, oops. Which of the following equations could define C as a function of t? Oh, now we do have to come up with the equation. Here we go. So look, let's first calculate the slope. Let's do 8.5 minus 11 is negative 2.5 over 1. So the slope is negative 2.5. Oh, sorry, over negative 1. What am I talking about? So it's positive 2.5. So this is out and this is out. And then the y-intercept is probably 1. 1 is 6. It's this. This is not the y-intercept because, look, that's at 1, so th this can't be right. Uh, y-intercept, I'm calculating that by going back by 1. Every time we go back by 1, applying the slope, go back by 2.5, and it should be 6. 8.5 minus 2.5 is 6. Okay, next. Refer to the following. These big ones are really problematic to me because you just have to process all this information. The results of an international survey contact lens fitting during a given time are summarized in the table. The table shows the number of total fittings and the mean age and years of patients who were fitted with contact lenses during that time period. The total fittings consisted of new contact lens and refittings. Okay, total fittings, boom, 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 mean age of the people, and then percent refittings, percent new fittings. Got it. Okay. I think I got it. What is the range in years of the mean ages? Here are the mean ages. Uh, the mean ages of patients surveyed who had contact lens fittings in the country shown. So just the range. So what's the smallest to the, the difference of the smallest to the biggest range? And looks like 26.6 is the, oops, 26.6 is the smallest. And the biggest is 36.3, 36.3. I'll just use the calculator. 36.3 minus 26.6, 9.7, oops, boom. Of the following, which best approximates the number of patients surveyed who received refittings in New Zealand? Refittings in New Zealand. So it's, it looks like it's about Refitting, this is, new fittings is like 38%, maybe. Let's say 30, let's say 36%. So 64% had refittings approximately in New Zealand, right? That looks about like 64%. And then so we do 64% of, what is New Zealand? Total fittings. So 0. 0.64 times 721, 0. 0.64. 461.44. So I'm going with this is the best one. It's approximate. So there we go. Next. Park Ranger asked a random sample of visitors how far they hiked during their visit. Based on the responses, the estimated mean was found to be 4.5. Okay, hold on. With an associated margin of error of 0.5 miles. Which of the following is the best conclusion uh, from these data? It's likely that all visitors know. Um, 
it is likely that most, uh, it isn't, well, hold on. Let me just think about this. It's likely that most hit, no, this is crazy. It is not impossible that any visitor, it is not possible that any visitor hike less than, no, it could be possible. The mean is, they're just saying the average. It is plausible that, that the mean distance hike for all visitors is between, I'd say this. Because the margin of error means it's plus or minus 0.5 miles. So it could be as low as four, as high as five. And so we're saying, hey, and, and then they're applying it to, the, to all the visitors. That, that's what they're that's what it is. Okay. Observed matings among fruit flies. The table below shows the observed mating, and we're, we're 12 minutes in. Shows the observed mating frequencies among a group of fruit flies raised on either starch or medium. Okay. What fraction of the observed matings were between fruit flies that were raised on the same medium? Hold on. Observed matings were between fruit flies. Okay. So these are both on starch. And these are both on, both on maltose. Okay, so these are on the same median. So it's 42 on the same median out of a total of 59. And there it is. That's it. Just understanding the table data. Um, it's a pretty straightforward question. Okay, we're getting, I think we're, let me see. We might be halfway through now. Da, da, da. Yeah, we're almost, oh, no, no, not yet. Okay, the figure above Shows, oh God, okay, graph is correspond temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, humidity, temperature, humidity, and water vapor that will result in different snow crystals. Based on the graph, which of the following is a combination of temperature and humidity at which prisms will be formed? <laughs> do, 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 do. Okay, so prisms are down here. So it's in this zone. Here, I'll shade it in like this. Just so you can see. That's my prism zone. Okay, so we're looking for a point that falls into this zone. Do, do, do. Okay, five, which is here. Nope, that's out. 15 and 0 0.18. 0 0.18 is up here. Nope. 20 could be and 0 0.02. Yep, because 0 0.02 is down here somewhere. 30 and 0 0.08 is probably up here, so that's out. Boom, done. W A sample 46 grade selected at random uh, from a certain 40 students completed a survey about morning announcements. And 32 thought the announcements were helpful. Which of the following is the largest population in which the results can be applied? Well, that's obvious. All fourth, I'd say all fourth grade students in the school because they were selected at random. I don't know about all because they're fourth graders, so it might not be the same to third and second, whatever. No, uh, this is the best. All fourth grade students at the school. It's a random sample from a certain school. That's where it applies. Okay. Ryan is comparing five different hay baler machines. The bales made are all in the shape of a cylinder as shown below. The price of each hay baler and dimensions of bales of hay make it table below. Bale diameter range, blah, blah, blah. Okay, what is this? 19. Of the following, ra which ratio is closest to the width of bales? A baler A to the width of bales made by baler B, D. So it's A and D, right? On average. No. Which ratio is the width of bales? So it's 46 to 62. Uh, and then they're dividing both of these by 62 to get one. See how all of these are one here? So 46 is 0.74 to one, it's this guy, um, 19 to 20. Which of the following is the closest to the percent by which the price of hay baler E exceeds the price of hay baler C? What, wait, to the percent by which the price of hay baler E, exceeds the price of hay baler C. Okay, so we need to first take the difference. 46,900 minus 32,000. 32,000. Okay, so it's 14,900. And then I'm calculating the percent out of 32,000 because we're saying, hey, what percentage does it exceed this by? Not by percentage of this. Usually we're saying it's 30% it's more than blah, 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 using, than hay baler C, using hay baler C as the baseline. So I'm going to take that value, divide it by, what was it, 32,000? 
32,000. And then that's how we get a decimal equivalent. And then we multiply it by 100, and that's the percent. So it's it exceeds it by 46% approximately. There's that number, right? 46.6 is the more rounded version, and that's it. Okay, which, of the, which ordered pair is the solution to the system of equations above? How do I want to do this? We could plug and chug, but that seems awful. <clears throat> so I'm going to use a little substitution. I'm going to isolate y. Oh, wait, 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 wait. No, we can just use um, elimination. Look at this. It's perfect. Just add them together. X plus X is 2X. The Ys cancel out. Let's not mark that up, though. Equals 1 plus X squared minus 3. Uh, 1 and negative 3, now we got x squared, we got a negative 2, right? These guys combine to give me negative 2. And I'm going to subtract 2x to bring it over here. And now we set it equal to 0. Now we can fact. Oh, this is not factorable. And the, the hint that it's not factorable is we got radicals in all the answers. Uh, so let's use qu uh, quadratic formula. So it's negative b, which is positive 2, plus or minus square root of b squared, which is 4, minus 4 times a, which is 1, times c, which is negative 2. Boom over 2a, which is 2. This is negative 4 times negative 2 is 8. 4 plus 8 inside, sorry, 4 plus 8 inside is 12. So 2 plus or minus square root of 12 over 2. We can pull out a 4 from this. Square root of, it's 4 times 3. Square root of 4 is 2. So 2 plus or minus 2 square root 3 over 2, which reduces, let me just move that actually, which divide everything by 2. It's just 1 plus or minus square root of 3. And that's my solution for x. Yeah, so the only one that has 1 plus square root 3 is this one. Because this is 1 plus square root 3, 1 minus square root 3. There's two solutions. <clears throat> and I haven't even calculated the y, but I could easily calculate it. If I plugged this into for x, it's 1 plus square root 3 minus y equals 1. So add y to the other side, subtract 1, and y, of course, does equal square root of 3 when I plug that in. So this is definitely right. Didn't need to do that, though. Okay, next. Oops. The graph of the exponential function in the xy plane has through point 0, 0,1, 1, 4, and 216, which the following is not true. Ooh, boy. Okay, hold on. Mm. Oh, it's probably this y equals 4 to the x because if I plug in 0, I get 1. If I plug in 1, I get 4. If I get plug in 2, I get 16. Not that you need to come up with that equation. But <clears throat> anyways, a line can be drawn that does not intersect the graph of g. That is true. Because an exponential looks like this. Um, so I could easily draw like a line down here because this will never, it, it doesn't go below 0. It doesn't go negative. Or I could draw a line, uh, I don't know. You could draw, or I could draw a line like something like this that would never intersect it. A line can be drawn that intersects the graph at exact, yeah, that's definitely true. Um, yeah, that's, oh, sorry, which of the following is not true? That's e obviously true, I go like this. Uh, that's also true, I could go like this. No, that's impossible. <coughs> In a, oops. In a right triangle, I'm going to draw a right triangle. Doot, doot, and doot. Tangent of one of the two acute angles is, is, so tangent is opposite over adjacent. I'm doing that because it's opposite over adjacent, right? Tangent of this angle must be this. What is the tangent of the other acute angle? Let's call this beta, I don't know. So tangent of this one is opposite over adjacent. I didn't even need to do this. It's 3 over square root 3, which is this guy. I'm surprised. Oh, wait a minute. Is it positive or negative? It has to be, it has to be positive can't be negative because first of all if it's a po if that one's positive this is going to be in the same quadrant right hold on let me think about this for a second yeah yeah of course it's positive what am i talking about cuz these two values must both be positive or negative and we're using the exact same values so yeah it's the same <laughs>
trip me up for a second. And the XY plane line L has a slope of two. Okay, line L is a slope of two. K is perpendicular. Okay, look, check it out. If it's a slope of two, K is perpendicular. That means the slope is the negative reciprocal. Negative reciprocal of two is negative one half. Oh, look what they did. That's so mean. So which one of these slopes has a slope of negative one half? We'd have to isolate each one of them. But I can tell you it's A because these guys are the same sign, which means the slope will be negative and the 10, no, wait, it's not A. That would be a slope of negative two because I'd move this over to be negative five Y equals 10 X. 10 divided by negative five is negative two. When I find the right one, I'll show you why. It's not this one. That would be positive one half. This would be positive. This would be negative. Okay, let me show you why now. So now if I isolate, I'm gonna subtract six X from both sides. I can tell that these are the same sign. When they're in the same sign on this side, it's gonna be a negative slope. 12 Y equals negative six X plus 36. And then we divide both sides by 12. I don't even care what the Y intercept is, but look, that's negative one half X. Slope of negative one half, and that's what we wanted. Next, okay, we're doing really good on time. So this figure is, oh, got it, 25. The diagram sh above shows Edward T. Hall's concept of space surrounding a person defined by four non-overlapping regions. Intimate space, blah, blah, blah. Personal space is, so this is intimate space, is radius of one foot. Personal space is four, four feet with the circle of four feet. Okay, if I... This little radius in here is one. I'll just write that. This little radius in here is four. Uh, social space is this one with a radius of 12 feet. So space is the region within a circle, but outside of personal. Yeah. Public space is the region with a circle radius of 25. So of the shaded, re okay, so what's social space? Okay, <clears throat> so it says social space has a radius of 12. So first of all, what's the area of all of this, including the center section? So it's pi r squared, which is, this. it says the radius is 12 squared. So it's 144 pi. But then we have to subtract, it says everything, but we have to take out this inner portion. So look, yeah, that has one and that has four, but this entire section, if I'm understanding the question right, is a radius of four. So we're minusing four squared pi, or whatever, right, pi r squared, which is 144 pi minus 16 pi, 134, 128 pi, but use a calculator to, oops, to double check that subtraction. You don't wanna make a silly mistake. I'm pretty sure that's right though. And look at these so close together, but that's it. And th this is the 127 pi that are trying to trick you because they, so you might want to double subtract. You might subtract, oh, and then I have to subtract one pi, the inner circle, so it's 127 pi. Uh-uh. You're including that one pi in that four. Okay. I need to create a batch of green paint by mixing two ounces of blue with three ounces of yellow. She must mix a second batch using the same ratio of blue to yellow paint. She uses five ounces, of, okay, so hold on, two to three, blue to yellow. She uses five ounces of blue paint. <clears throat> Look at the nice fraction I'm setting up. How much yellow paint should she use? Two to three, five to X, cross multiply, 15 equals two X. Boom, X equals 7.5. So she equals uh, 7.5 ounces of yellow paint. Nope. Wait a minute. Hmm. Three ounces more than the amount of yellow using, no, that would be six. 1.5 times yellow using the first batch. Yeah, that's it, I think, hold on. Three times 1.5 is, oh wait, what? No, <laughs> what am I talking about? Uh, blue paints. Wait, what? In the second batch, yeah, yeah, that's it, sorry. Uh, 1.5 times 5 is 7.5, just to double check. Of course, I know that's true. Okay, so it is D. In the equation above, A is constant. For what values of A does the equation have infinitely many solutions? All right, basically where we get the same thing on both sides. Let's just isolate X best we can. 
uh, distribute that four. That's the first thing I'm gonna do, minus 12, minus eight X. Don't forget that minus sticks to it and goes with it. Okay, and uh, then let's add 12 to both sides. Add 12 to both sides. These guys cancel out. Then it's eight X minus, eight X minus eight X equals zero. I'll just add eight X to both sides. Wait, is that the best way to do it? Yeah. AX equals 8X, yeah. And I mean, look, this A obviously has to be 8. If we're having infinitely many solutions, we need the same thing on both sides. So it, it has to be 8. That means that then we can plug in any value for X and we're always going to get a true statement. Likewise, if we bring it back here, and I'll just show you really quickly because we got a lot of extra time. If A is 8, it's 8X minus 12 minus 8X equals negative 2 negative 12. It, these two now are equivalent. Like if I were to add 8x to this side, I'd have 8x minus 12 equals 8x minus 12. And it's, so no matter what, it's the same on both sides, no matter what we plug in for x, it's a true statement. All right, three questions left. These are usually the toughest of the bunch. Uh, the wholesale uh, price of a kilogram of lentils decreased by 1% from previous months for six consecutive months. If x is the number of months since the price began to drop, why is the cost of killing? This is exponential. I already can tell you because it's going down by 1% each time. And that's not linear. Model the cost of lentils over this time period. It's this. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Where's that 1.65 coming from? Okay, I guess 1.6. Wait. Is there any data? Okay. Anyways, this is kind of like interest rate or something. You know what I'm saying? This is the like almost like the formula for compound interest, where it's my starting value, uh, the amount is changing by, and then where we end up. So, so assuming 165, because it's had all is 165, must be the starting price, and each year it's going down by one percent from the previous year. So at one year it'd be 99 percent of what it was. The second year, it would be 99% of 99% of what it was initially. You see what I'm saying? So when whenever we have, it's like a compounding of the interest that's dropping, dropping, dropping. This would be, this is totally wrong, and this is these would both be going up. But this is wrong because that's a linear 1% drop. Actually, this doesn't even make any sense because this would be like, the price would actually be going up by 99 cents, then it would be going up by $1.98 after two years. So that actually is totally wrong. This is the only one actually where the price is dropping, so it has to be C for that reason too. Okay, uh, let's speed it up just in case these questions get harder. The equation above is true where R and T are positive constants. Okay, all right, watch the strategy here. <coughs> this looks crazy, right? But I could do one of two things. I could combine, I, I could actually combine these guys into a, a, a common fraction, or I could multiply everything by this value, either or. I am going to combine them. I'm gonna multiply this to get common denominators by x plus five over x plus five. I could do either or, honestly, it wouldn't matter to me, but let's just go with this. This one is x minus two over x minus two. So that's my instinct, because I'm like, hey, I need to get these guys equivalent on both sides, and then I can just set the numerator equal to the numerator. So this on the left becomes two x plus 10. This becomes distribute, distribute, 3x minus 6, and now they're all combined over x plus 5 times x minus 2. See how both of them have become x plus 5 times x minus 2? Right? Equals, well, let's move this over. We need a lot of room for this one. I told you these get hard. Rx plus t. I'm just going to rearrange. It doesn't matter. X plus, just so they look the same for multiplication, right? commutative property. Okay, now whenever we get this like this and the denominators are the same, goodbye denominators, they're all gone. And now we just have, and let's combine these, this 2x plus 3x is 5x, 10 minus 6 is 4rx plus t. Now I can clearly see that, look, look how nice this matches up. r must be 5, 4 must be t. And they wanna know what is the value of r times t? Well, it's 5 times 4, which is 20. That's not so bad. So just recognize you see something crazy like this. Look, common denominators, just go with your gut and say, hey, let me get these guys together, get the same denominator across the board, everything combined, and then we can just wipe out the denominators. AX plus A, last of the multiple choice, AX plus A equals three, where A is non-zero. Shalang must be equal to X plus one. 
Mm. Watch this. When in doubt, factor. I've told you guys this many times, and it's this is very confusing, right? But if we if you just think, oh wait, I can factor an a out. X plus one equals three, and look how nice this is. There's x plus one. I want to know what x plus one equals. Isolate it. Divide both sides by a. Boom. It's three over a. You could also plug and chug if you were really confused. Like if you plugged in three, it'd be three x plus three equals three. Um, yeah, this is the only one where if I plug in 3 over A, I get this turns into 3. This turns into, wait, 3 plus A. Wait, what? Does that make sense? 3 plus A. A equals 0. Hmm. Oh, wait, 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 wait. What did I just do? Hold on. Wait, did I? Oh, I plugged it in for x. It's this equals x plus one. I'm sorry. Three over a. Yeah, it's right. It's right. It's right. <laughs> I overthought it. Okay. Oh, look at this. I totally wrote in the space. And now look, we've got <coughs> eight problems left with 23 minutes. This has gone really fast. This is great. We got tons of time. Coming in here with 15 minutes is usually good. Okay, what satisfies this? Let's let's isolate. We want to get rid of this square root first thing. So square both sides. X plus four equals 121 minus 4 minus 4 and x equals 117 boom uh, next is this flow box and whisker plots uh, okay how many fish does the median number of fish caught each day on boat b exceed okay median of, of on a box and whisker plot is this little line right here so once we identify those two medians, we just subtract. So this is 40. This one is 35. So how much does it exceed? 40 minus 35 is 5. You just got to know how to read a box and, whoops, box and whisker plot to answer this. This is the max value. These are the min values. These are the lower quartile and upper quartile. I don't know if they'll, you know, you, you just, just review box and whisker plots and then they're very easy problems. If A is the mean and B is the median of nine consecutive integers, hold on. Oh, nine consecutive integers. I'm pretty sure it's zero. <laughs> but let's, let's think about this for a second. Um, one, two. Okay, if they're consecutive integers, it has to be like this. Um, the median is obviously 5. I'm pretty sure the mean is 5, too. I mean, like, I know it is. It's 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 5, which is 45 divided by 9 is also 5. Yeah, so it's 0. The equation above gives the height of an object above the ground. But, but anyways, let, let me just reverse back to this. M my point is, is something like this. If you're not sure, uh, if it doesn't come to you I instinctively, just do this. Choose a sample of nine and figure it out. The equation above gives the height of an object above the ground in feet. Okay, how many seconds after his launch does the object reach the ground? A AKA, we're trying to find the x intercepts, so in this case, the t intercepts. All right, you know, when does this equal zero? First thing, I'm going to factor out negative 16 out of this whole guy, and this becomes t squared minus 4, right? Because it's negative times negative would give me that positive. Minus 5. Oh, sorry, 4t minus 5. Factoring will make life a lot easier. And then now, is that, fa yeah, it's factorable. So check this out. And I always like to factor out the negative. I like this term positive. It just makes things easier. So it's 5 and 1. But it's, it's what multiplies to ne negative 5, what adds to negative 4. So it's going to be negative 5, positive 1. You see that? And so my two values for t are whatever make this go, each one go to 0. So negative 1 and 5. We never have negatives in our answers for free response. So it's t equals 5. So it's 5 seconds. So just remember, whenever we have these parabolas and, hey, where does it hit the ground, just immediately say, it's either going to ask the where does it hit the ground, which is the x-intercepts, or it's going to ask what's, at what time did it reach the highest point. That's the vertex. And to find the vertex, just as a reminder, remember this, it's negative b 
over two ways, the x value of the vertex, plug it in to get the y value if they ask, hey, what was the max height? Okay, oh boy, all right, long problem. So the formula, Ohm's law electric circuit, circuit has a resistance of 500. All right, I should read this carefully, I think. With I and amperes, potential difference V and resistance R. So resistance is R. So it has a resistance of 500. And its potential difference will be generated by N 6-volt batteries. Hold on. Potential difference by N 6-volt batteries. 6N is the total voltage, right? You see that it's generated by N 6-volt batteries that produce a total difference of 6N volts, right? Because each one produces 6 volts, and there's N of them. It could be 10. It could be 100. So I multiply by six. The circuit is said to have a current of no more than 0.25. <clears throat> so the current, which is I, is meant to be 0.25. I mean, this is actually no more, so less than <coughs> or equal to. What is the greatest number? But we're just going to solve for N like this, of six-volt batteries that can be used. Okay, solve for N. Multiply both sides by 500. I think that's 125. Okay, here, let's mu look, multiply both sides by 500, 6n, and I think this is 125, 6n equals 125, let me double check, Point. yeah, and then we're going to divide both sides, oh, okay, divide both sides by 6, it's going to be a decimal, 125, it's 20.83, now, here's the question, this is why, this is why it's a 35, it's a little harder, well, what does it say? 20.83. What is the greatest number N of 6-volt batteries that can be used? We can't enter this because that's we, you can't take a part of a battery. So the question is, is it 21? Do we, t like we typically round up, or do we round down? Greatest number. If we did 21, guess what? We'd be going over that 0.25 volt. So that's where you really got to think and, and analyze what is the language, and we're saying, okay, well, then my greatest number is going to be 20. Um, you know what I'm saying? You know, let's highlight that because it's at the top. So I know that's my answer. I've got a lot of, oops, I got a lot of extra time here. I can see that 16 minutes and I only have three problems. So here we go. The next white plane, K intersects the Y axis. Here, let's do a little graph. I don't know if I need it, but oops. K intersects the Y axis at points zero, negative six. And passes through the point, I don't know, two, two. If the point 20W lies on line K, what is, okay. Let's just come up with the equation for this. My slope is the difference of these guys. Intersects the y-axis point zero negative six. Oh, and actually that's my slope that's my y-intercept. So the slope is two minus negative six, which is eight, over two minus zero, which is two, which is a slope of four. So my equation is y equals four x, and then my y-intercept is negative six. Boom, there's my equation for the line. Now we want to know what is the value of k, or what is the value of w, and the x value for w is 20, so plug 20 in for x times 20 minus 6, 80 minus 6, and that's 74. I'll put it here. Okay. The science classroom, when labs are performed, students are seated at lab tables. If the, if the teacher assigns two students to each lab table, Four additional lab tables will be needed. Okay, so X number of tables, students in class, I guess. Number of students, we'll say. Okay. Um, okay, all right, okay. So if I, if I put two students per table, so it's like two times the number of tables,
four additional lab tables will be needed to seat all the students, which means that there theoretically should be eight that are left out, right? Because if we got four more tables, two at each, that would accommodate. So 2x and then plus a lingering eight equals the total number of students. Then the teacher assigns four students to a lab table. So now he's putting four at each lab table. Four lab tables will not be used. So we only need, we don't need to use all the tables. Hold on. We use four less than the total. And that will accommodate all the students. Done. System of equations. Now that that's set up, we solve. Boom, boom. So I do remember this problem, by the way. This is one of the ones that I did with one of my students. 4x minus 16 over 2x plus 8 equals y. Let's use elimination. Uh, so I'm going to multiply uh, however you want, actually. Wait, we want to solve for y. So let's, let's eliminate x. Multiply 2 times the bottom. That's negative 4x minus 16 equals negative 2y. This is 4x minus 16 equals y. These guys cancel out. Negative 16 plus negative 16 is negative 32. Negative 2y plus y is negative y. Divide both sides by negative, and y equals 32. So it's 32 students in class. And wait, let's just see for fun. It's the number of tables. 24, 12. So there's 12 tables. And you can see that this is going to work, right? If I get two students per table, that's 24 students, will be eight left out. If I do four t uh, tables per student, I use eight tables, all the 32 get placed, and then I have four left over. So it works. 12 minutes for the last problem. It's amazing. So much time. The number y is... I immediately go into equation format when I see a y and something like that. Is is always my equal. 20% greater than the number x. 1.2 times x. Boom. The number z is 20% less than y, meaning 80% of y. The number z is how many times y? We want a relationship between z and y. Ah, well, I'm z and x, excuse me. So let's do a little substitution. y equals 1.2x. Plug that in for y. z equals 0.8 times 1.2x. 0.8 times 1.96, I think. 0.8. I mean, 0 0.96. 0 0.96 is how many times x? It's 0.96x. So we just enter 0.96. Boom, done. All right, 11 minutes to spare. And that happens sometimes. All right, I'm going to stop the timer. Now, if you were taking the test for real, you would use all of this time, if you, if you finish this early, to review your answers. Go back to anything that you had marked as questionable or iffy and just start there and boom, and just start pounding the pavement, review everything twice, three times, if you, if you have the extra time. I'm not going to do that because whatever, we're going to check the answers. And if I did make any mistakes, uh, we'll just review them together. Uh, let me quickly, uh, I'm going to quickly just see how you guys are doing over here. All right, guys, so I see that uh, I see that you guys are uh, asking a lot of questions, which is amazing. We're going to get, hey, my sister's on. What's up, Mooney? Yeah. Uh, uh, all right, so I see that you guys are on asking questions. Let me get through, let me check all the response, uh, my answers, and then... And then I will uh, see if I got anything, made any mistakes. And if I didn't, then we will go through your guys' questions. Here we go. Calculator. Boom. Done. Let's use this. Oh, hold on. I just need a new... Thing. I'm going to I'm gonna just paste it up here. It's a little easier to do this quickly. All right, let's do it. So go to red. Let's do a little thicker. And we're going to zoom out. Okay, B, C, C, A, 
B C C A B A D D A B A D D A <clears throat> 10 is B A A C C B A A Oops C, C, that's 14, right? <coughs> Excuse me. D, D, C, B. D, D. Okay, hold on. C, B. Uh, let me just not cover that up completely. And then 19 is A, D, A, D, A. D, A, D. I know there was one question, right, that I was a little iffy about. I don't know if we passed it already. Okay, then 23 is, wait, hold on. D, D, B, D. D, D, B, D. And then 27, D, C, C, D. D, C, C, D. All right, so far so good. Let's check the free. Oops, let's check the free response. The E three or no thirty sorry thirty one. So one seventeen. Boom. This one is five zero five five zero five. Thirty five is twenty. 74, so far so good. 32, 0.96, yay. All right, so all of them correct. Awesome. Now into the question section. So I'm gonna start going through, please. Okay, all right, let me see what we got here. I got so, wow, a lot of stuff. Hold on, let me start from the beginning. All right, all right. Depending on your time, do, do, do. Let's see here. Okay, I, I see you guys posted your emails. I'll I'll post them. I'm gonna hit show and allow those. Um, wait, where is that? Um, go over nineteen again. Okay, Skylar Vanderhoven. You want to go over number 19. Let's start with that. Number 19. Where is it? Okay. Oh, hold on. Let me just, I have to make sure of one thing because I have a, a paid Q&A session starting at, what time is it? Hold on. Uh, oh, and by the way, guys, if you're interested in joining the paid Q&A uh, session, I have to double check what time it is. Where is it? It's at April 27th. At what time? Wait. Oh, I don't have a scheduled event. Never mind. I thought I did. Do I not? Okay. You know what? I didn't set it up, so whatever. Uh, I'll just stay on here and answer your questions. Okay. 19. Of the following, which ratio is closest to the width of bales? And so when we're talking about ratio, we're immediately talking about a number compared to another number, right? So which of the following is the closest of the width made by A, made by a to made by B? So check it out. The width values are right here for A and for B, and for D, excuse me. So the first thing we can say is the ratio is just 46 to 62, and that's it. That, that would be done, and that would be, if this was an easier question, they'd put 46 to 62. Um, but you notice that these values are not that, so they're, they're making it harder. And it's like, well, how do I get to this point? Well, you, the, the one thing that you notice is that for all of these on the right-hand side, which the right-hand side should be D, because it's A to D, right? For all of these, 
D has turned into one. So we want to turn our D value and our ratio to one as well. How do we do that? Well, we can divide it by 62, simple. If I'm, but if I'm dividing this by 62 to keep the ratio good, I have to divide both sides by 62. And when we do that here, I get one for this, which is what we want, and 46 divided by 62 gives us that 0.74 value, okay? That's number 19. All right, answer for 22, oh yeah. Um, in number 14, you just multiply seven, which I got from the guy. Yes, yes, I mean, that's, that is a, definitely a way to do it. Please repeat number 25. Okay, say fulla. I'm doing it right now for you, 25. The diagram above represents blah, 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 blah. Oh, uh, okay, so this is that whole personal space one. This is a really kind of confusing one. I can read, let me redraw this a little bit so it's one two three four circles i'll redraw it and i'll explain it a little bit better than than i think they did so with i'll make it a little bigger okay so what they're saying is that this little guy out here the most close one has a radius of one then they have this next zone that has a radius of four. They didn't draw it like this, I think, intentionally, so people would be confused. Then they've got, let's use a different color, then they've got this radius. And they got this radius, which is a distance of, what did I, I think they said 12. And then the outside radius was, I think, 15, right? 20, 25. Then the outside radius was 25, but that that was uh, what you call a red herring. It's it's irrelevant information because we're not even dealing with this outside one, okay? And then they said we want you to find the basically the shaded area. You know, you don't have to understand what this is talking about. Just understand what they're asking, and they want this whole section. Here, you kind of get what I'm doing, right? Shaded in as best as I can. Oops. Okay, there's my shading. So we want that section. So first of all, to calculate, if I wanted to calculate this entire circle, it's just the radius, of, see that entire blue radius? It's 12 is my radius squared, which is 144. Oh, whoops. It's 144, which is 12 squared times pi. So that's the entire, that's including everything. But I don't want this inner white stuff. I want to uh, subtract that because I only want the radius of the blue or the area of the blue. So the, the thing is this circle, uh, this inside blue circle, see how I drawn the radius? The radius is four of that whole thing. It doesn't matter that this little one is one. It's gonna be included if I just use that radius of four. So the radius of four squared is 16 pi and that's why we have to subtract 16 pi from, from 144 pi and we get 128 pi. Does that make sense? And let's see. Number 20. In number 20, when I did it, I got 31.8% because I thought that they meant the percentage from the, pro oh, because it says how much, uh, what percentage by Yasmin, it said by what percentage did it exceed the price of C, okay? So if we're talking about exceeding something, percentage by which is exceeding, we gotta go with the percentage based on the lower value. If it said, what percentage less is it than, than this, then the thing after then this is the baseline, then you're, you're looking at that percentage of the larger item, okay? Okay, 37 and 36. Yeah, I am Indian, somebody's asking. Yeah, I am Indian. Okay, hold on. Okay, so let's see here. <clears throat> hey, John, I know you're asking to uh, to be moderated. Let's let's talk about that offline because I want to I want to talk about it a little bit more with you. Okay, thirty six. So this one. Okay, the bottom line is is we have a linear equation and.
and it says it's a line, and we have two coordinates. So let's let's start like this. I didn't need to graph that out, by the way. That was that was a waste of time, to be honest. But we have two coordinates, two two, and whenever we have two coordinates and a linear equation, and we're gonna come up with the equation, we gotta stack the coordinates to come up with slope. Now there's a formula for slope. I don't even use it. I just say stack the coordinates and subtract down. So that way you don't make any mistakes in terms of the ordering. So then the difference of the y's, remember it's rise over run, y's over x's. So the difference of the y's, two minus negative six, oops, over two minus zero. Two minus negative six is eight, two minus zero is two, eight over two, boom, we have a slope of four. And look, they gave us the y-intercept. Any zero, negative six, that's a y-intercept of negative six. So my equation for this line is now y equals <clears throat> 4x minus 6. And then we want to know this value. Well, they give us the x value for this. We're basically just trying to find the y value. So we take that 20 <clears throat> and we plug it into our equation. y equals 4 times 20 minus 6. That's 80 minus 6, which is 74. All right. Question 37, and then I'll do 32. Okay, 37, I think, was the hardest question on the whole test, me personally. So let's do it again. I'm going to leave this work up here. Now, the key with any word problem like this is being able to identify the variables and relate them. Uh, in this case, you have to draw two, create two relationships. So actually, anytime two variables, two relationships. Okay, so <clears throat> um, I'll answer your question in a second minute, uh, but it's different for everybody, right? So... First of all, it says, I already identified that we've got X is my number of tables, Y is my number of students. So we need to make some sort of variable association like that. Then we say, so I need to draw a relation between the number of tables and the number of students. So I said, well, cool. Well, if, if there's two students at each table, right? So if I put two students at each table, then it, it's not going to equal all the students. All right, it's not going to equal all the students, but um, how do I put it? Uh, <clears throat> hold on, I'm trying to I'm trying to see if I can if I can come at this another way. Uh, and why is the number of students? Yeah, okay. I, so I, this is I can't think of a second way. But anyways, my thought was, oh, we'll need four additional lab tables. Well, wait a minute. If we need four additional lab tables. It means that there's eight students, right? Because two at each table, there's eight students that we can't accommodate. So 2x, which is all the people that are being seated, plus this random eight that can't be seated, gives me my total, because 2x is the number of students seated. This is my total number of students. Well, guess what? That equals y. Y is my total number of students. Equation number one. But now, if I say, oh, wait a minute, if I put four students at each table, or sorry, four lab tables will not be used, meaning I can accommodate all my students if I use four less lab tables than we have. So four times four less than all the lab tables that we have <laughs> gives me my total number of students. Again, it seats all my total number of students. Now we have our system, and now we can solve the system. So again, I'm going to distribute. So that's 4x minus 16 equals y. Um, 2x plus 8 equals y. Let's use elimination. So I'm gonna, I said I'm going to multiply. I want to get rid of the x's because we're really solving for the number of students, which is y. So I'm going to multiply both sides by negative 2. This becomes negative 4x minus 16 equals negative 2y. The bottom becomes 4x or stays 4x minus 16 equals y. Then we just add these two together. That goes away. That becomes negative 32. This becomes negative y. Negative 2y plus y is negative y. Multiply both sides by negative 1 y equals 32. And that was 37. 32, somebody asked. 32. By the way, guys, if you're still watching and this is helpful to you and you appreciate the live stream, please, please, please click that like button. It really helps me out with the videos. I want to spread the word. I want to get more people prepped and prepared for the SAT on Saturday. So if you could click that like button, I would really, really appreciate it. And subscribe if you want to see more from the Scalar Learning Channel, of course. Here we go, box plots. Okay, this is a box and whisker plot. <laughs> you just have to know uh, how to read a box and whisker plot. So anytime you see one, I'll kind of explain it. 
do to do do we'll do a little thing here there's the box oops and like this it's not the greatest but it's okay okay here is my minimum value these little tails the whiskers right at the end this is my max value this is my lower quartile this edge right here this is my upper quartile right here and this middle part is my median that's all you need to know now you can read a box and whisker about like look the, my lower quartile for this one is 25 my upper quartile is 45 didn't ask about that though probably could i've seen it before actually where they do but less likely to be asked about What's my max for boat A? Oh, it's 55. So you see, if we understand how to read a box and whisker plot, this is a piece of cake. If you can't read a box and whisker plot, it's impossible. All right, 32, then 14 and 24. Uh, 20, 14 and 24. Okay, so what I did in 14 was they wanted to know the number of patients who receive refittings in New Zealand. What, so the percentage that received new, fitting, re, received new fittings was this percentage, right? So what is that percent? Look, this thing all adds up to 100. So I approximated, and I think I was wrong. I think I approximated up to this value for the new fittings to be like, 46, maybe it's maybe it's 48 was a better approximation. Doesn't oh sorry, not 48, 38. Excuse me, 38, right? Because it's just under 40. So if this is 38, this has to be the remainder going up to 100, which is 62, right? 62 plus 38 is 100. So now I know my percent refittings is 62 percent. I said 64, but both would give me approximately the same answer. And then I just looked at, well, what was the, did they give us the total? And they did. The total fittings was 721. So all I need to do is take 0.62 or 62%, 0.62 times 721. Oops. And that equals 447, which is that. Yeah, so I think that's, I, I got something close to that, but I think that's the number they wanted us to use. <clears throat> 20. Four, and then I'll come back to your question on 22. Uh, what did I? What did? What did you want in this one? Oh, this one is simply we know. First of all, it says we need a, as a slope of two. We want the line perpendicular to that. Perpendicular slopes are opposite reciprocal, so we need a slope of negative one half. Now, you could isolate each one of these and figure out which one has a slope of negative one half. I tried to take a little shortcut, but that would be fine. So watch, this one's negative five, negative 10x. So I'm gonna add 10x to both sides, put them all into slope intercept form. Negative five y equals positive 10x plus 20. Then divide by negative five and stop there. We already know this, that we don't care about the y-intercept. My slope for this one is negative two, not negative one half. So this is out. Go here, subtract 3x from both sides. Negative 6y equals negative 3x plus 14, but I don't care about the y-intercept. Divide by negative 6, divide by negative 6, and stop, because that's a positive slope of 1 half. So that's out. Then C, uh, let's make some room here, is 4x minus 2y equals 17. Subtract 4x from both sides. Negative 2y equals negative 4x plus 17. Divide by negative 2, divide by negative 2, stop. There's my slope. Negative 4 divided by negative 2, positive 2. That's out. So this was 1 half. This is positive 2. And then let's go here. Subtract 6x from both sides. 12y equals negative 6x plus, whoops, 36. Divide by 12, divide by 12, stop. Negative 6 over 12, that's negative 1 half. So D is your answer. For 22... Uh, I said I didn't need to know the equation. Hold on. Oh, yeah, you don't because it's an exponential equation. That's all you need to know. So exponentials always look like this, where they go, they approach zero as a horizontal asymptote, and then they kind of go on forever in this direction. So then once you know that, you can easily see that a line could be drawn that will never intersect it or one below this thing, right? 
because it's never going to go like y equals negative five. It's it's never going to cross cross that. One that can be drawn to intersect it exactly once, easy, like this, because it doesn't bend back or anything like that. Uh, a line that can be drawn that intersects it at two, because it kind of makes this bell shape, we can get one that would slice it this way. That makes sense. But the other thing is definitely if I can do three points, I have to be able to do two. So like this one, there's no way that this is true without this being true. I mean, pretty much. So if so, it, and then now we know that this is true. This is the most difficult to do three points, I would say. So that's out. So that's the answer. That's what can't be done. Uh, <laughs> Mahmoud saying, "I'm too excited when I uh, when I do this stuff." Yeah. Oh, so I, okay. People have asked me to do English. Here's the thing. Let me, all right. You know what? Actually, what I can do is like Mahmoud has sent me some English problems. I'll tell you guys what I'll do. Let me see if I can th throw in some English stuff uh, where I'll, you guys kind of give me like a sampling of problems. You guys can submit it to my email. I'm about to wrap up this live stream, by the way, but you guys can send me emails to, okay, I'll do 21. But to Huzefa, and then and then I gotta cut it short. At Scalar Learning dot com. Oops. So you send me emails there, and I'll get a collection of different verbal problems and stuff, and then I can go over them with you guys and explain how to approach them. I'll I'll, I'll do that. And let's see here. Um, you said 21, right? Okay. Uh, pyramid question and 21. Okay, that that's it. Oh, the pyramid question. Which one is the pyramid one? Can you give me the number? I don't see it. I don't remember doing it. I don't think there was a pyramid question in this. Okay, anyways, I'll do 21 first. Okay, this was a very tricky one, 21. So look, what or which ordered pair is a solution to the system above? Now, Anytime we solve a system of equations, we're thinking of either elimination or substitution. So let me put these original equations back up. X plus Y equals X squared minus three. Now, <clears throat> my thought is when I see this, my first thought was actually substitution. And I could have done that. I could have isolated Y up here by adding Y to this side, subtracting one. So Y equals X minus one. I could have taken this. In fact, let's do it that this way. The last time I did it with elimination, where I because it's set up for elimination, you just literally add these two and the y's cancel out. But let's do it this way. Now I'm going to plug in x minus one for y. So now it's x plus x minus one replace the y equals x squared minus three. And then now we just got to solve for x. So now I see I've got a two x minus one equals x squared. Anytime we got a quadratic, let's just isolate and set to equal to zero. So I'm gonna subtract two x from both sides and add one from both sides. So it's x squared minus two x plus one minus three. These guys combine to become x squared minus two x minus two. Okay, and this all equals zero. Now to solve, we can either factor or quadratic. But I looked at the answer choice and I'm like, wait a minute, if they all have roots in the answer choices, this is definitely not factorable. So I'm pretty sure we're gonna have to use the quadratic. So let's plug it into the quadratic formula to solve. So it's negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus four ac. I assume you guys have this memorized. It's a very important formula. I have a song on this, so the, the, the song is a great way to memorize. I have a music video you can look on my YouTube channel. Quadratic formula song, just Google, search for that, but it goes, <clears throat> it goes like this. Negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So if you if you listen to that chorus, you'll get it. You'll get it down for sure. Uh, I still use it sometimes in my head to, to remember. So this is negative b is this value. So it's the negative value of negative 2. Hold on. Negative negative 2, which is positive 2. So two plus or minus square root of b squared, which is four minus four times a times c. So one times negative two times four is negative eight, but it's minus, so it becomes plus eight over 
2a, which is 2. And then you isolate this down, you, it ends up becoming 2 plus or minus 2 square root 3. Because this is square root of 12, you can pull the 4 out as a 2 over 2, and then divide both of these by 2, and we get 1 plus or minus square root 3. And the only one with 1 plus square root 3 or 1 minus square root 3 in the x term is this one. So it's got to be a. And let's see. 20. Okay, last one, guys. My voice is going. <clears throat> last one will be question 26. Oops. Oh, question 17. We're, oh, question 17. You asked first. All right, I'll do 17, okay? I'll do 17 and 26, and then please, I, I can't do any more, guys. My, my voice is hurting, and I got to get ready because uh, I got to go do my private tutoring appointments. Yes, don't worry, I'm doing 17. Okay, the, this one is all about understanding what the heck this graph is talking about. So this graph is saying that these zones are where these crystals will form. So like, for example, here, let me zoom in a little bit. For example, up here, plates are happening all in this range, in this zone okay, of values. The columns are happening all up here in these values. Uh, let's use this color. Six point plane, like whatever this is, I don't even care. You know what I'm saying? Like I don't need to know what these crystals are or anything. And that's where they try to get you bogged down, I think, in terms of, hey, look at all this vocabulary, look at all these science terms, like what's happening? And to throw you off, you just go cut straight through just trying to understand the the graph and the layout of the numbers not necessarily the content that's how they get you with the amperes and the volts and all this stuff it's just all super superfluous now we've got we've got this set up okay so based on the graph i don't care about any of this which of the following is a combination of temperature and humidity look temperature is the x humidity is the y at which prisms will be formed and again prisms are in this zone right here so now let's, let's plot these points, okay? So we've got 5 and 0.15. So that's 5 degrees Fahrenheit. and point, So 5 is out here. And 0.15 is halfway in between 1, 0.1 and 0.2. Boom. That's going to be a six-pointed star. So that's not it. 15 and 0.18. So here's 15. Here's 0.18 is up here. That's needles and columns. No good. Let's do this one. 30 and 0.08. 30. And 0 0.08 is up here, right? Here's 0 0.08, boom. That's six-pointed stars. And then 20 and 0 0.02, here's 20 degrees. 0 0.02, right? 0 0.05 would be up here. Boom, that's the only one that lands in prisms, okay? All right, last, last uh, one, which is number 26, and then we're done. Anita carried a batch of green paint by mixing two ounces of blue paint with three ounces of yellow paint. She must mix a second batch using the same ratio of blue and yellow paint. Oh, yeah. Okay, so check this out. We've got a ratio. She's, like, currently using a ratio of two blue to three yellow, okay? And in the second batch, she's using five blue. See how the blues line up and the yellows line up? Five blue and a certain amount of yellow. How much yellow should we use? We got a nice proportion equal to a pro proportion, then we just cross multiply to solve for x. So we got 15 equals 2x, divide by 2, divide by 2, and the bottom line is x equals 7.5. So we know that we know that x equals 7.5. We know that we're using 7.5 ounces. The way that this problem gets you the way that they're trying to trick you is they're saying, all right, well, it's 7.5 ounces, but now you have to figure this out, what, what's going on here. Well, the five ounces, we know it's not. Uh, three ounces more than the amount of yellow paint in the first batch. Well, we used three ounces in the first batch, so three ounces more than that is six. That's no good. Um, 1.5 times the amount of yellow in the first batch. Yellow is three. 1.5 times 3 is 4.5. Nope, because we use 7.5. 1.5 times the amount of blue used in the second batch. Blue was 5 in the second batch. 1.5 times 
5 is 7.5, and that's our answer. Okay, guys, that is it. Uh-oh, something going on with my stream here. Can you guys still hear me? I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, I think the stream... Oh, there's an error. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Oh, no. All right, I don't know what's going on. Hopefully, you guys can still hear me, but we're at the end of the stream anyways. So thank you guys so much for joining. And, oh, it's working. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sweet, sweet, sweet. I don't know what was going on there. So look, we're at the end of the stream. Thank you guys so much for joining. Still 29 people on. I hope you guys have all enjoyed this. And if you have not done so yet, please, please, please click the like button. I try my best to get all your questions answered in a timely fashion. Hopefully things are clear and things are improving. Somebody asked me, how do I get an 800 I'm at a 760? Use this week, if all you care about is math, use this week to practice like a beast. Uh, do, I, I've posted my schedule of what I'm doing each day. If possible, take these tests before and then watch the way that I solve and tackle these problems. The other thing you should do is if you haven't done all the Khan Academy tests or whatever tests are out there that you have access to, do them on a daily basis. Practice, practice, practice. If you're at a 760, you're probably in a zone where you're only making mistakes. Silly mistakes are on the really hard ones. The more you see a variety of these truly difficult problems and work out the silly mistakes in the practice, that's the way that you're going to make sure that you're going to be picture perfect on test day and go for that 800. Uh, and I wish you the best of luck. It's a, it's a high goal. It's a lofty goal, but it is definitely doable. Uh, I know from experience. So you can do it with the right amount of work and a good attitude, which I, I think you already have because you're here and you're trying to do your best. Thank you guys so much for joining. If you haven't done so yet, make sure to click subscribe if you want to see more from the Scalar Learning channel. Uh, my schedule's posted for the whole week, so I'll be on Monday through Friday doing these streams. Again, best of luck, everybody, on Saturday, and I'll see you all next time. Take it easy.